Welcome everyone! For today is a very special day. Thanks to the vocal support that you have shown thus far, we have reached 5000 subscribers. And naturally, that means it's time for a new tier list. Regular viewers of the channel will recall that I've made a video on the 10 hardest trophies in Yakuza some time ago, where the focus was specifically on mainline Yakuza games, and only a single trophy being covered per each game. So to properly expand on that established basis, we will now cover the entire Platinum journey and its difficulty for nearly every game in the franchise. Let's start off by explaining all the entries present on this specific tier list. Obviously, the PlayStation 2 Yakuza games are absent, but in their place are the Japan-exclusive remasters for the PlayStation 3, that thankfully feature trophy support. Now, for anyone wondering why, for example, Ryuga Gotoku Kenzan isn't on this list, that's because that game was released before trophies were implemented in PS3 titles, and Kenzan never received a patch later on to fix that. But considering how hellish both of the Ishin Platinums were, that was probably for the best. You will also notice how there are seemingly some duplicate entries present, and the reason for that is that certain remasters in the series had substantial enough differences from their original releases, which would warrant them being treated as separate entries altogether. As of the time of this recording, the last RGG release is Like a Dragon Ishin, so keep that in mind. Considering that this will be a subjective ranking based on my own criteria, we'll first take a look at a ranking based on the general rarity of each listed platinum for the sake of comparison. The higher the game is listed, the more difficult its platinum should be to obtain. As for my own criteria for ranking them, it will be a combination of the time you need to invest for the trophies and the perceived difficulty of the tasks required. And lastly, here's how to interpret the individual tiers. D tier is for the games I haven't platinumed yet or where I have insubstantial info to place them on the list. C tier means that the game was generally easy to platinum compared to the others. B tier is average difficulty, A tier is above average to hard, and on the very top we have S tier, which roughly translates to this platinum nearly made me hate the game. Now we can finally begin the tier list. Going by release order, the first Yakuza platinum is the one for Yakuza 3, and this should set your expectations for most of the platinums in the series going forward. Things like beating the game on the highest difficulty, doing all the ultimate challenges, and completing every sub-story are tasks that you will find in essentially every single game. But thankfully, things like a forced crafting system or 100% in the completion list aren't present here, much to my joy. Now, you've probably heard horror stories about 3's Platinum Trophy in particular, but when talking about this Platinum, there is an important distinction to be made between the original release of the game and the remaster. The PlayStation 3 version had a ton of content cut from it, making it appear as a fairly doable Platinum compared to the rest of the franchise. Keeping in mind how the minigame Master Trophy is arguably the worst part of Platinum in Yakuza 3, you'll understand why having significantly less side activities to do would be such a big deal when comparing the difficulty with the newer release. Then there's the question of combat getting harder due to the switch from 30 FPS to 60 in the remaster. It resulted in enemies blocking a lot more frequently than they would normally, and enraging many newcomers who'd just come off the heels of the more modern Yakuza games, which were a lot more beginner-friendly by comparison. For Yakuza 3 Remastered, it took me around 107 hours to get the Platinum, and apart from the aforementioned minigame Master Trophy, most of it felt pretty standard to me, as I'd already Platinum Zero and both of the Kiwami games by then. Some other standout trophies included Break Ace, which is just rubbish, let's be honest, and Fashionista, which personally bored me to no end because I'm not a fan of the hostess building minigame. None of this is to say that the PlayStation 3 version is easy, but it does feel more fair by comparison, and the overall experience feeling more fine-tuned, particularly with the combat. Taking everything into account, I'd say the original Yakuza 3 warrants a solid B tier, while the remaster gets a high A tier for the challenge. Clocking in around 100 hours on a Yakuza game is pretty much the average for trophy hunting here, 
and the journey didn't scar me nearly as much as some of the other entries that we will cover. Oh, and to quickly clarify on a remark from the old trophy video, when I say that any of these Platinums are quote-unquote easy, that relates to their difficulty when compared to the other Yakuza Platinums specifically, and not trophy hunting in general, because trust me, this franchise can be genuinely nightmarish, even for seasoned trophy hunters, so kindly keep that in mind. Alright, next up we have Yakuza 4. In stark contrast from the previous two entries, Yakuza 4 only had one trophy that was different between its original release and the remaster. That trophy is called History Buff, and it just requires you to have watched the story recaps for Yakuza 1 through 3. Frankly, both Yakuza 4 and 5 offer nearly identical experiences between their respective PS3 releases and the remasters, but since RGG treat them as separate releases and separate platinums, so will I. Yakuza 4 was easier than 3, by a mile. While you might think that having 4 separate characters may make the experience more grindy, having everything take place exclusively in Kamurocho and there being no minigame master-esque shenanigans present made this Platinum feel like just relaxingly ticking off boxes on a proverbial list. The most annoying trophy that I could recall was Master in Training, and that's mainly because I really, really don't like that minigame. Sodachi is cool though. It only took me around 82 hours to Platinum the Remaster, which I know sounds like a sarcastic remark, but again, anything below 100 hours is a Yakuza completionist's vacation. The only other thing to note is how here, you have to beat the main story three times to get the Platinum. I've done a similar thing with Yakuza 3, because in the older games, you'd need to beat the game on hard mode to unlock the highest difficulty, which you'd then need to beat for a specific trophy. But while you could get by with just two playthroughs in Yakuza 3 by immediately going for hard mode, assuming you are masochistic enough, in Yakuza 4 you explicitly had to beat the game three times, as there is a trophy tied to beating the game on normal mode as well, without changing the difficulty, so that's pretty interesting. While 4 is far from being the easiest platinum here, it is definitely below average when compared to the rest of the franchise, so both of these entries will go in C tier. The next entry chronologically would be Kurohyo, and I can already tell that this will confuse a number of viewers. Yes, the Kurohyo games are PSP exclusive, which should mean that they don't feature conventional trophy support. However, there is something interesting about them that made me include them on this list regardless. See, both of these games have a built-in set of achievements, many of which require you to do tasks you'd find in your average Yakuza trophy lists. And the main reason I'll discuss them here is that the final achievement you can unlock in both of the Kurokyo games is a trophy explicitly classified as a Platinum. You could perhaps say that, oh, okay, so these games would fall under a 100% completion category? But they don't, funnily enough, because there's a number of documented entries you don't need to do here and you'll still get the Platinum by simply avoiding them. For example, completing every crime event in Kurohyo 2 10 times isn't required for the Platinum, but would need to be done if you were going for 100% completion. Did this utterly confuse everyone, myself included? Yes. So let's take these entries with a proverbial truckload of salt for the sake of education. So Kurohyo 1 is a strange case, because unless you're playing it on native hardware, you will face many bugs along the way. For example, this game has a multiplayer mode you will need to play through to get a number of trophies, and while you could theoretically get by with just hooking up two devices with their own copies of the game, one of the multiplayer modes is set up as a 2v2 fight, and the AI partners that the game gives you, when playing with only two devices, will result in the game crashing over and over again if they make a wrong move. What move would that be? I have no idea, because the game just kept arbitrarily crashing on me while I grinded the multiplayer modes. The best you can hope for is that you can defeat your direct opponent before they make a single move, and that your partner just tanks the hits so that you can try to prevent a sudden crash. In my case, even that wasn't enough, so I hooked up three separate devices to the multiplayer and still had to suffer through well over a hundred crashes. 
On top of the multiplayer shenanigans, this game is also plagued with missables of different kinds, which is a huge problem when you consider that one of the trophies requires you to own every single item in the game. Now, I don't just mean you will need to have held them at some point in time. I mean you literally need to own every single purchasable or otherwise obtainable item at once if you want the Item Maniac trophy. If you sold something by accident, you'll have to start over and feel the wrath of the RNG over random encounter drops. On my current account, it says that I clocked in around 160 hours on Kurohyo, though I'd reckon that there was even more than that being clocked in. Hell, even if you try platinuming this list, you literally have to spend a minimum of 100 hours on this game, because there's a trophy you get for doing just that. The fact that I didn't even know if getting the platinum was possible was the thing that made me keep going, and the fact that you can succeed in doing it makes me remember this journey as a hard one, but a rewarding one. Having said that, I sincerely hope that no one else is insane enough to try doing this nowadays, even with the new English patches, because this game is a hellish trial at times. It rightfully deserves an A tier placement. The next entry chronologically would be Yakuza Dead Souls, and I regret to inform you that, as of the time of writing, I've yet to play the game myself. Believe me, I've tried, but I don't have a PlayStation 3, my laptop couldn't physically run the game through an emulator, and PlayStation Plus just doesn't offer it on the streaming service. So if I ever get a proper PS3 in the future, you can bet that it will be used to exclusively play Dead Souls and Kenzan. But until the time comes, I will have to put this in D tier. Next up, we have Kurohyo 2, and I will immediately say that no one should ever try to go for this platinum. You've heard that right, and this is coming from the self proclaimed number one Born to be Wild fan. As much as I adore the Kurohyo games, the sequel is a minefield to platinum that, unlike Kurohyo 1, is not worth it. Now, why is that? Apart from there being no Cyrix Z style guides for the game in English, this game is riddled with far too many missables and glitches that will make the game impossible to platinum. For example, you obviously need to do every substory, but there is a glitch related to one particular substory towards the end of the game, titled A Great Combination 4. All you need to do to finish it is chat with a certain NPC near Millennium Tower and it will be documented as complete. However, if you enter Premium Adventure Mode, this substory will suddenly disappear from your completion log, making your current save file ineligible for the Platinum. You could say, well, just do the substories again in New Game Plus. And you know what? Fair point, because I did a similar thing with the original Kurohyo. But then this game has another substory that will glitch out, specifically in New Game Plus. It's a substory that becomes accessible once you've eaten at a total of 8 restaurants across Kamurocho and Sotenbori. But considering how your clear data also documents every dish that you've purchased at every restaurant, this results in the game for some reason being unable to register that you fulfilled the necessary substory requirements, which in turn means that you're not sent the necessary message that would trigger the substory to be accessible. And yet, even with all of this in mind, I've still contemplated redoing everything from scratch, even though I've spent well over 150 hours on this game alone. But there is one last devious nail in the proverbial coffin preventing me from doing that. That would be the Han Festival side activity, which for some ungodly reason registers as a set of substories. Think of it like the Colosseum matches. If you win, you ascend in rank. But in this game, you also have to quote-unquote defend your title, which means there are additional fights you will need to win before you're offered the chance at a fight to actually climb the leaderboards one position at a time. And the number of times you will need to defend your title increases as you ascend through the ranks, with the worst part being that you need to wait actual in-game time before you can access each individual fight. So in short, you'll just be standing near this guy for a minimum of 12 hours, and you have to do that all over again in Sotenbori for the second tournament. I have done everything in this game, but the Platinum will never pop, because of the glitched out substories I've mentioned at the start. And while there's so much more that I could say about the arduous journey that is this game, 
I'll save it for another occasion and put this game at the very top of the list for now. Kurokyo 2 is an otherwise breathtaking experience, but this trophy list was an utterly incurable mistake. Up next, we have the HD remasters for the original Yakuza 1 and 2. Now, much like with the previous entries, you should take these placements with a grain of salt. I still haven't popped the Platinums in the HD versions of these games. However, I did 100% the PS2 games a while back, and having sunk a decent portion of time into the HD versions on top of that, I found very little differences in the difficulty and approach to completion, so I will include these games on the list regardless. Now, I feel that the perceived difficulty of these two Platinums will largely depend on your personal experience with PlayStation 2 era games. For some, the combat may be too janky, and the lack of a safety net for completionists will make you redo a ton of activities if you weren't well informed ahead of time. Personally, I've grown up with the PS2 era, and these games felt like a genuine joy to go through, even with the many missables. I've invested around 100 hours into both of these games, and already knew what to expect thanks to having platinum their respective remakes and having studied the intricate guides done by the Patrick beforehand. For anyone unaware, before the world of completionists was graced by Cyrixie's guides, our go-to were the guides that were made by the Patrick, with his pieces on the PlayStation 2 games and Kenzan in particular being incredibly detailed and invaluable in the process of playing them. The main problems I remember in the original Yakuza's trophy list were getting S-ranks in battle review, beating Gamon, cause I tried doing it barehanded, and of course, completing Haruka's dreadful requests. The last one was mainly a pain due to the baseball minigame requirements, but this was hardly a surprise considering my mixed feelings on most of the baseball iterations in the series. Yakuza 2, on the other hand, felt pretty standard, honestly. From the sub-stories to the gambling minigames, even some with the exclusive content like Club Adam and Marietta, for the most part, it's just what you'd expect from an old-fashioned Yakuza Platinum. Even on my newest playthroughs of the HD versions, I was basically on autopilot, due to my previous experiences with the PS2 releases and the Kiwamis, so the language barrier didn't really phase me. Basically, I'll probably platinum them fully in the future, presumably after Gaiden and Like a Dragon 8 finally drop. So with all of that in mind, I will put both of these remasters into B tier for the time being. Now, let's see what's next. Ah, Yakuza 5. Whether or not you love this game, everything that it represents is, in one way or another, iconic. And so is the legacy that its platinum trophy had built for itself. For anyone out of the loop, Yakuza 5 was the first title that would necessitate 100% completion of a game in order to achieve the Platinum. And while not every game after it has followed in its footsteps, many a trophy hunter have suffered the consequences that came from this seemingly random decision. Before we go any further, both the PlayStation 3 and the PlayStation 4 releases of the game have had an equal number of trophies present, and the challenge they offer is an eye one for one from my personal experience. Now, I've invested over 180 hours into just one version of the game, at a point where I knew all of the ins and outs of Yakuza completion and had the divine help of Cyrixie's wisdom-filled guides, which is saying a lot. The problem with this game isn't necessarily the challenge that the individual tasks present, though there are some infuriating aspects to it, like reaching the top of the Colosseum ranks with each male character. But the real issue lies in the sheer amount of activities to do. Many of them just felt arbitrarily designed to pad out time, like the weapon and equipment crafting. I've only ever used around 10 of these 100 plus items that I had to craft, but the Hall of Famer trophy required them regardless. This game had some missable aspects to it as well, such as a karaoke song from Haruka's idol career, or a crafting item called the Mystery Stone, of which I'm pretty sure you only get a single piece in your entire playthrough. So if you accidentally passed on either of these two elements, or god forbid happened to sell the item I've mentioned on accident, all of your valiant efforts could have vanished just like that. The ultimate challenges ranged from blindfold easy to break your controller hard with no proverbial in-between to speak of. The various side activities you can do, while not explicitly listed in the completion list tab, 
are also part of the requirements, which made a certain Slavic Yakuza tuber despise the hunting minigame with even more of his slowly corroding heart. Am I being too melodramatic for this entry? Yes. And it fits the aftermath of this platinum. The moment I popped the Hall of Famer trophy, I exhaled the biggest sigh of my life, cause I'd known that this was as tedious as these games could ever get. And I know people will say, well then, just don't platinum the games if it isn't fun for you. But here's the thing, not every platinum is like this. Not even every Yakuza game that requires 100% completion is like this. A trophy list will often reflect the faults of the game that it is bound to, and in the case of Yakuza 5, there's simply so much presence to where even the highest highs that it can reach will be drowned out by several lackluster choices in retrospect. This game's platinums both belong in the highest tier, as far as I'm concerned, and while objectively they may not be as challenging as some of the games that I've put in A tier, the journey that Yakuza 5 had taken me on made me question why I was even playing it in the first place. Remember, if you see a game in S tier, my advice would be that you don't go beyond the main story and all the sub-stories, even if you are a seasoned trophy hunter. <sighs> okay, let's try and lighten things up a bit. Next in release order would be the original version of Ishin. So, I didn't actually play through this version yet, and despite having platinum the remake, which many people have stated is even worse by comparison, I will refrain from making any educated guesses on how hard it may be. Rest assured, I will play this game in the future, much like Dead Souls, but for the time being, the original will join it in D tier. And now we arrive at my very first Yakuza Platinum, that being Yakuza 0. Okay, here's the thing. This game is also frequently listed as one of the worst games in the franchise to Platinum, and as you may have guessed, it too has a requirement of completing the infamous completion list. Now, considering my past remarks on Yakuza 5, you may believe that I would tear this game to shreds in much the same way, but I won't. And this is where the more uplifting side of trophy hunting comes into play for me. Going for the Platinum in Yakuza 0 made me appreciate the game more than I did before. Now to clarify, this was the very first Yakuza game I fully played, so the fact that everything was still new and exciting to me can definitely be attributed as to why I look more favorably on this Platinum experience than others. Much like with Yakuza 5, I've also spent around 180 hours on this game, and I'd only found out about Cyric's guides about halfway through, which led me to the realization that I'd done many dumb decisions while tackling this perilous journey by myself. Like for example, the fact that I'd sold the Encounter Finder <clears throat> by accident. Look, a real man ought to be a bit stupid, right? Beginner mishaps aside, unlike Yakuza 5, or as we'll later discuss, Judgment, ticking off the completion list in Yakuza 0 felt like it was a rewarding experience the more I'd gone through it. With each task being equally valued and eventually granting you completion points, you weren't just working towards a shiny trophy icon, you were steadily improving the character that accompanied you in your quest. Shakedown farming, infinite sprint, Mew shoes, and everything else that Bob had in store at the shrine, all of these little drip-fed oddities added up over time. In Yakuza 5, many of the rewards I'd obtained felt kind of misplaced. It's the items I'd get from some specific activity had already become obsolete, due to a similar item or skill I'd already obtained hours ago. In Yakuza 0, however, many rewards that you'd get could only be obtained by conquering the completion list, and once you get a skill like the increased Mr. Shakedown returns, it impacts every other aspect of your gameplay experience for the better. Most importantly of all, going for this Platinum first gave me an understanding on how every Platinum in this franchise functioned. I'd figure out the most optimal routes to do multiple requirements in one go without even having to consult the guides all the way through. Don't get me wrong, there were many instances where the game was just wasting your time. Cat Scratch Fever is a pointless trophy that is just there for the infamy it can attain. The Dragon and Tiger system is even more ridiculous than the weapon crafting in Yakuza 5, due to the added RNG factor, and the minigame high scores that were demanded have permanently put me off of some undeniable arcade classics from Sega's library. But with Yakuza 0 as a whole, the experience felt like a balance back and forth through and through. 
For each challenging task, it felt like there was an equal amount of easy ones that I could fall back to and regroup. This is by no means an easy platinum. It's bloody hard, and it definitely deserves its spot in the A tier. But just like I've said before, going for it made me enjoy the game a lot more. And that's what a platinum should do. Hell, I might actually go for it all over again in a few decades time, once we don't get 17 new Yakuza games per year anymore. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Okay, apologies for the nostalgic rambling over Yakuza 0. Let's move on to Yakuza Kiwami. I've invested slightly over 85 hours on this game, and after the previous Platinum, this felt like a breeze in many ways. Even though this game also requires doing everything on the completion list, the list itself is almost a one-for-one -one of Kiryu's portion in Yakuza 0, with the only difference being that the money you'd have to earn in a gambling minigame would be altered to be tags or chips. But due to the fact that there is no annoying equipment grinding and no RNG-induced hell akin to JCC, it actually felt pretty easy by comparison. Plus, this game had cheat items for the gambling minigames, which I'm pretty sure wasn't the case in Yakuza 0, so this trophy just felt like zero light, kind of like the general wealth of content it features. This isn't to say that it's an actual low-effort thing, because aspects like Haruka's requests are as infuriating as they were in the original Yakuza on the PlayStation 2. And of course, we can't forget the car chase scene, which I remember many people in my old video's comments saying they didn't find too difficult. Which, okay, I get that perspective if you played with a mouse and keyboard, but even though I've done this on Steam, I've played with a proper controller and the precision required was genuinely annoying. Especially when you need to do the whole snake flower farewell tour to get back to the car chase scene. That's just some really unfortunate checkpoint design at play. I will say though, that this game's climax battles, I absolutely despise. Proving grounds shouldn't be a thing, and I will die on that hill. The funniest, or perhaps the saddest thing about these challenges is how I was so infuriating with the ones preceding the boss rush challenges, but then once the game finally gave you a fully powered Kiryu that you rightfully deserve, I've tiger dropped every boss into oblivion. And even if I happened to get hit on occasion, the Dragon Style's heat actions could heal me back to 100%. I'm honestly glad that these challenges became more scarce as the series went on, because we don't really need another 50 proving grounds. All we really need is a proper boss replay feature, like in Kurohyo and apparently Dead Souls. Anyway, back to the ranking. I'll put Yakuza Kiwami in B tier for now. Basically, a middle of the road entry for me, leaning slightly more so towards the difficult side of the spectrum. Next up is the first Dragon Engine game. Yakuza 6. This is a very unique game in many ways, as it introduced a ton of unique content on release. But as time went on, many people have started downplaying its qualities, as it featured comparably less activities to partake in when compared to something like Kiwami 2, for example. And indeed, by any general metric, this game is a lot less demanding to Platinum than any other Yakuza game as I've personally only had to invest around 60 hours to obtain it. There are no climax battles to beat, no 100%ing of a completion list, and no tedious crafting systems present. Now, here's the thing. I genuinely consider this to be one of the best Platinum experiences in the franchise, but it's not really tied to the lack of challenge or length, but more so due to the approach that RGG had taken in making the trophy list as a whole. Rather than having you just blindly check things off of a proverbial list to progress, Yakuza 6 aims to make you experience its world in unconventional ways. For example, there's a trophy you get for getting ambushed by enemies while trying to take a picture. You have a different trophy tied to jumping off a really high spot on the map. One for walking in first-person mode for 30 seconds, taking a photo of Onomichio, finding secret passages, and so on and so forth. Many of these activities are things that players have simply done on instinct while familiarizing themselves with the new world this game presented. And the fact that you're rewarded for just being curious is a fantastic choice on RGG's side. To give an example from a different franchise, the way these trophies were approached reminded me of the early Ratchet & Clank games. The PlayStation 2 games have obviously preceded the concept of trophies and achievements, 
but they still had these oddities called skill points, where you would be, again, rewarded for playing in an unconventional manner. All you had to go off of were the namesakes of the individual skill points, which led to so many aha moments that have positively marked my early years in gaming. And seeing such a premise get mirrored in a game like Yakuza 6 was oddly nostalgic. The fact I didn't need to spend time on arbitrary things like spending money on RNG-based material farming made me more excited to visit each and every shop in the game, even though I'd played Yakuza 6 long after I'd platinumed Kiwami 2 and therefore already knew the new layout of Kamurocho as a whole, for the most part. I'd gone out of my way to play non-mandatory minigames like Puyo Puyo and try to get a high score because I wanted to and didn't wind up hating the game due to a ridiculous high score requirement that would normally be attached to it had it been a part of the completion. This Platinum follows the general design logic of the original Yakuza games, where you have a ton of stuff to experience if you choose to look for it, yet it also manages to apply that premise to trophy hunting or even completion as a whole, which I find to be absolutely phenomenal. Now, don't get me wrong, there are tedious trophies present, in particular, the trophy you get for maxing out a clan creator member and the one for achieving 100 victories, both of which are just blatantly pointless. But as a whole, this game offers such a memorable experience to where things like those grindier trophies will quickly be forgotten in lieu of the quirky additions this game prides itself on. Due to how easy it is, Yakuza 6 has to go into C tier, but don't interpret this as an indication of the game's quality. It's genuinely an amazing experience throughout, and a game I'd recommend on all accounts. And then we have Yakuza Kiwami. Unlike its mechanical predecessor, this game marks a return to trophy choices exhibited by games like Yakuza 5 and Kiwami, as you once again have to do everything on the completion list. And there is even a strange substitute for climax battles in the form of bouncer missions. While this game's platinum wasn't really memorable to me, even with it being my first experience with the Dragon Engine, it wasn't all that difficult either. It took me around 90 hours to get the platinum here, and in a lot of ways, it felt like Yakuza Fire's platinum if it just knew when to stop. Anything combat related was incredibly easy, apart from the mission called Pandemonium, and the general process of completion felt less demanding due to how quickly you could amass money through something like the cabaret, and in turn, you'd be able to get any type of XP you'd need thanks to the restaurant-dependent experience farming. Really, the only thing that stood out to me was, again, the tedium of the bouncer missions, as you basically had to beat the same 26 missions three times over. Even if the game had just made you tackle the hardest missions from the start, this still would have felt unnecessary, because with the general difficulty leveling, the only notable increase in challenge could be found in the last few missions, and to their credit, those missions are exceptional highlights. Plus, you get an infinite heat skill for beating them all, if the game wasn't enough of a casual stroll for you already. That aside, you might have trouble popping certain minigame-related requirements, but this isn't exclusive to this particular game, nor does it feature some of the worst examples of malicious RNG slowing down your process. So, as a whole, Kiwami 2 would probably be a high C tier for me. If you already love the game, chances are that this Platinum won't phase you nearly as much as you may have thought, considering the completion list addendum. Oh boy, here we go with Hell Incarnate! Ladies, gentlemen, distinguished individuals far and wide, Lost Paradise is a nightmare to Platinum. This may sound as a shock, seeing as how positive I was about the game in a video that I've done for the manga's 40th anniversary, and don't get me wrong, everything positive that I said about the core game still stands. The completion process, on the other hand, is one of the worst that RGG has ever concocted. There's a specific reason why I've listed both the Western release and the Japanese release of the game here, which will soon become apparent, but let's first discuss the Western version. Easily the most annoying trophy here is related to upgrading every single Destiny Talisman to the max. For anyone confused, they're kind of like the trooper cards in Ishin, except there's less of them and there's a really annoying crafting system tied to maxing them out. The fact you need to grind for absurd quantities of very specific materials in three different locations is essentially the perfect representation of this game's platinum journey as a whole. 
The Western version doesn't require you to achieve 100% completion, but with how every single side activity is designed to be grindy for the hell of it, you might not be able to tell the difference. Not only that, but the general difficulty of the individual tasks is comparable to something like Minigame Master from Yakuza 3. For example, the fact you need to get S ranks in all four courses of death batting, which is just extreme baseball, is the closest that I've ever gotten to putting my dual sense through a bloody blender. Even with the Miracle Bat, the way this minigame's interface functions is one of the most unintentionally infuriating things I've come across, and I've already platinumed the Yakuza games into the double digits by now. On the other hand, if you're awful at rhythm games, you'd be delighted to know that you need to achieve a full combo in eight different clinic songs, which are basically karaoke, but extreme. There are many, very many things about this game that are just there to fill a proverbial void, but thankfully, if you are well versed with the logic of Yakuza completion, you'll find a way to circumvent some of this grind. For example, there's a substory where you need to give a hundred million IDL to this old hag that is permanently tied to your hideout, and only after you've paid the amount would you be able to fight against Amon. But if you planned ahead and left that substory for last, you can just reload your save file after getting the trophy for beating Amon and still have all of the money intact. Which, trust me, you will absolutely need it to cover the costs of refining the aforementioned talismans and purchasing the associated materials. Similarly, there's an expensive type of armor where you need to grind in three separate activities to obtain it, those being the Colosseum, the Casino and Buggy Racing. But the cost they amount to is not worth keeping that accursed armor, especially with how I was already at level 99 by this point, so again, reload your save file after getting it, cause you really need all of the individual currencies you can get if you want to get through this process as painlessly as possible. Keep in mind, this is just the western release we're talking about, and I'll still put it in the highest tier. Now, what about the Japanese version? Well, if you'll recall all of these handy-dandy shortcuts and workarounds I've mentioned earlier, basically all of them are worthless. Cause this version of Lost Paradise does require 100% completion, and as if the apparently subdued version wasn't enough of a hassle, looking at the Japanese trophy list makes me wonder the sanity of whoever implemented these requirements into the game. For example, where you would normally need to heal 30 people to get a trophy in the western version, here, you'll need to heal 100 people. This is just pure RNG and doesn't benefit you in any conceivable way. There's another trophy where the western release requires you to finish 50 normal fights, 5 scripted ones and 5 in-store ones. Again, RNG. So what does the Japanese version do? It ramps up the scripted and in-store fights to 30. Each. There's also a bunch of missable stuff like the death cries should you become overleveled, though that's present in both versions of the game, and the treasure map related RNG that is mandatory to deal with in the Japanese version, which is probably comparable to, if not actually worse than the dungeon grind in Ishin Kiwami before the patch. Yes, it really is that bad. If there's anything you should take away from this video, it's that when anyone asks you what the worst Yakuza Platinum is, you can confidently say it's this one. The Japanese version of Lost Paradise is objectively the absolute worst. And if you actually went for it and managed to stay sane afterwards, you deserve to have a level 3 drink being named after you. Okay, what's next on the ooh boy? Judgment and Judgment Remastered. Okay, here's some context. I've invested 90 hours into the remastered version before I realized there was any kind of difference between the two versions of Judgment in terms of their platinums. I'll get more into it later, but for now on, let's discuss something that's consistent between both versions. The big issue with this platinum is that it takes away the player's freedom to tackle its content in the way the players themselves would choose. What do I mean by that? Well, normally, if you want to do a certain side activity in Premium Adventure, there's rarely a substantial barrier of entry. For example, Mahjong, Pocket Circuit, Majima Construction, your biggest issue there will probably be the money, and you can thankfully efficiently generate it in numerous different ways. But then you compare these to Judgment's side content. Okay, 
Let's say you want to do all of the drone races once you've beaten the story. Well, you'll need a ton of specific materials and an ungodly amount of money to compete in 95% of those races. So how do you make money the fastest? Well, by playing the VR minigame. Problem is that you can only play it by having these items called play passes, which are random enemy drops, but you can also purchase them at certain establishments. So basically, you need to grind out play passes so that you unlock the ability to grind money, and in turn, eventually get back to the original activity you actually wanted to do. Now I know someone will say, oh, well, just get the free pass. Okay, fair point. To get the free pass, you need six individual vouchers, all of which are obtained through completely unrelated side activities. Essentially, this game wants you to play it in a very specific order and a very specific way, which makes the grind feel much more forced and tedious than something like Yakuza 0 or Kiwami, even though all of these require 100% completion. The biggest issue is how you don't even feel rewarded for doing all of this in judgment. For example, there's no point in building each individual type of drone part when you find the specific type that works best for your playstyle. And GA Labs, the project you need to finance, is just a pointless money dump for which you don't even get a proper good job dialogue prompts upon completion. Imagine if this building you finance wound up being something like the Insomniac Museum in Ratchet & Clank, a standalone level where you interact with a bunch of cut content. It would make all of this feel worth it so quickly. But this quick starter project simply doesn't do that. Also, the specific minigame requirements here are just too much. Like most of the arcade games that have unnecessarily strict high scores to beat, hell, even Mahjong itself asks too much of you, and this is coming from a person that genuinely adores that minigame. There's a ton of other stuff that I won't get into right now, but you're welcome to expand on it in the comments, should you so choose. Now, despite what I've said about this Platinum, I still didn't wind up hating the game. It was hard as hell at times, but this version of Kamurocho and its inhabitants is arguably the most unique in the series, and many of the oddities that you can find felt charming and fun to interact with, just not to complete, necessarily. The fact that I still consider this as one of the top 3 best Yakuza games to date, despite the horrendous Platinum, should tell you just how amazing this game really is. The PS5 Platinum rightfully belongs in A tier, though. And what about the PS4 version? Two words. Puyo, Puyo. It might sound outrageous to make a distinction between two releases solely due to one minigame being absent, but with the amount of people I've seen utterly rage out on the Platinum and even give up on it solely due to that minigame and the RNG tied to it should be more than enough of a justification for separating them. I did play Puyo Puyo in Yakuza 6 and tried emulating the experience of completion for the hell of it, which honestly makes me pretty happy that I randomly went with the PS5 version of Judgment when I was on the PlayStation Store. Long story short, the PS4 version is worse for completion and will be placed ahead of the PS5 version thanks to this little minigame. Next, we have the first quote-unquote oddball of the list, Yakuza 7. I say oddball because this was the first game featuring turn-based combat that I actually finished and thoroughly enjoyed. I'd assumed that this new direction would result in a drastically different Platinum experience, but oddly enough, it just felt like your usual switch-up when a Yakuza game adapts a new engine, even though this is still just some Dragon Engine goodness. It took me 9-6 hours to Platinum this game, and the fact that there was no 100% completion necessary was a great choice. Again, much like with Yakuza 6, you'll wind up exploring more out of curiosity, but similarly to Lost Paradise, there will be instances where this game will require completion-esque behavior without actually going for 100%. Things like maxing out all of Ichiban's personality traits, beating every cop in Dragon Cart, reaching an executive hero rank in part-time hero, etc. Really, the biggest challenge in this game will obviously be the true final Millennium Tower, and I really didn't expect I'd enjoy it nearly as much as I did. The final fight in particular is a proper standout, even when compared to the other Amon fights in the series, and while you will need to be cautious, thankfully this game is still lenient on those of us less familiar with the intricacies of turn-based combat, even when it comes to the game's biggest challenge. Just grind those accursed vagabonds, get some good weapons ready, and enjoy the show. 
I'd say this game is a solid B tier, because apart from the grind tied to maxing out your jobs slash equipment and the RNG rubbish tied to the Hong Kong trophy, I was pleasantly surprised with how balanced the overall experience was, which makes me equally excited and mortified at the changes that Infinite Wealth will bring to the table. All in all, this was a really cool Platinum. Next, we have Lost Judgment. In a lot of ways, many of the criticism that I've thrown at the original Judgment apply here, except this game is bigger. It took me around 120 hours to get the Platinum on the PS4 version, which I originally installed thinking it would take up less space on my PS5, and dear god, I really needed all the storage I could get back then. If you're curious how this is relevant to the Platinum journey, we'll circle back to it soon enough. As for the Platinum, it felt like a journey less focused on difficulty, and more so on excessive time investment. Many of the things that would feel like insurmountable tasks in the original game were replaced by things that just take an eternity to do. For example, in the drone races, you normally have a set of time trials you'll need to complete. In Judgment, getting the best equipment was obviously a necessity, alongside superhuman spatial awareness, but you could win the regular races without either of those skills, kind of. In Lost Judgment, however, the later races were so difficult to where the aforementioned equipment and spatial awareness felt like the bare minimum to win. There were so many races where the only way I could actually beat the AI opponents was by simultaneously beating the time trial record. The Paradise VR minigame was irreparably ruined, by now taking even longer to finish a single round, making the grind a lot more annoying and time-consuming. The Amon fight, rather than being really challenging, was just utterly disappointing this time round, with him just spamming extracts, which made me realize just how easily you could pound him into oblivion by using a single one yourself. No fun phone-stealing shenanigans or unique arena switch-ups. Just a random schmuck who ruins a hilarious introduction with an underwhelming fight. But as a whole, there are far more problems that you can simply solve by just grinding then there are tasks that will require you to actually get better at a given activity. Looking at things like Ercelios or the Robotics Club. I know this was all doom and gloom so far, so let me circle back to an earlier comment on this entry to brighten the mood. As I've said, I've actually platinumed the PS4 version first. Seeing as you get both the PS4 and PS5 versions of the game upon purchasing a digital copy on the PlayStation Store. Now, this is where things get pretty funny. As soon as I platinumed the PS4 version, I immediately uninstalled it from my PS5, only to realize 5 milliseconds later that I forgot to capture some footage of the final boss for a video that I was working on. After screaming into a pillow, I then slowly but surely reinstalled the game, only to then be greeted with a different looking start menu. This one prompted me to import a PS4 save file, and once I did, I was bombarded with notifications telling me I'd popped a bunch of trophies. It was then that I found out about the wondrous world of the so-called Autopop Platinums. Lost Judgment is one of the few Yakuza games that will grant you an additional Platinum for your troubles, assuming you've done everything on the PS4 version. So after grinding for some miscellaneous trophies on the PS5 version for a few hours, I basically got two Platinums in the allotted time. The reason why this is so important is that I'd originally listed Lost Judgment in B tier, because this oddity made my recollection of the Platinum experience a lot more positive. But upon re-examining the individual tasks, I snapped out of my rose-tinted vision and placed this game in the rightfully deserved A tier. It's still easier than Judgment, but much more time-consuming. And finally, we have arrived at the infamous Like a Dragon Ishin, or Ishin Kiwami, as I will be referring to it. You might be curious as to why this game would be seen as infamous this early in its lifespan. Well, the original Ishin was already regarded as one of the grindiest Platinums in the franchise by many, and even prided itself on being one of the most challenging games in terms of its combat alone. What Ishin Kiwami did, on the other hand, was double down on the grind and ease up on the challenge. While I haven't personally platinumed the original Ishin, there were many different sources that would attest to the aforementioned premise in one form or another. Most notably, this amazing blacksmith guide by All Star Bros, and an incredible article on Ishin and its remake by Skeeth, both of which will be linked in the top comment. Now, as for the specifics on Ishin Kiwami, 
This game obviously has a 100% completion stipulation, otherwise it wouldn't be this infamous. Much like with Lost Paradise, a number of activities are unnecessary time wasters, like having to give three high-level healing items to this idiotic amnesiac to progress your friendship meter with him by just one level. This game has a ton of friendships you need to max out in the slowest ways possible, which contradicts with a number of similar mechanics present in the games preceding even the original Ishin. There were also a ton of completion requirements that were incredibly finicky to pop, even when you did everything correctly, like certain memoirs refusing to spawn and substories refusing to progress unless you exit an area through a very specific loading zone. The money grind, as you could have imagined, is one of the worst in the series, as all of the prices related to the blacksmith activity were astronomically inflated. In your payout from the most viable money-generating minigames, like chicken racing, was greatly lessened, even without taking the removal of the chicken racing glitch into account. Even without all of these oddities, the drop rates for many of the rarest materials and the dreadful seals were so horrendous that RGG had to actively patch the game to fix it, and it still took an eternity to grind everything out. Frankly, just looking at the completion list will give you a good idea of what went wrong. Having to do 200 orders in another life, eating food from your inventory 400 times, activating trooper cards 1500 times. You could have cut all of the platinum requirements in this game by half, and it still would have been a challenge to complete them thanks to the time investment needed. But I kept playing. And even after having invested 120 hours into this game, which is possibly one of the most tasking platinums in the series, I've still returned to it, because the core of the experience is just that good. If you're a trophy hunter, I'd recommend skipping over this game's platinum, as many of the completion requirements detract from all the things this game does right, of which there are many. But if you are an enjoyer of Yakuza games, who hasn't experienced this particular game yet, you should play it when you get the chance. That is essentially the running theme with all of the games that I've put into S tier. I adore all of them for different reasons, but the journey to their platinums was not one of them. So I'd advise you to stick to the main story and the sub-stories. And there you have it. I'm fairly certain that most of these entries will stay where they are even in a decade's time when we get another 10 to 15 thousand new Yakuza platinums to judge accordingly. But for the time being, this was my experience with these particular trophy-reliant journeys. While it may feel like I didn't enjoy many of these Platinums, there is a reason why I keep going back for them when playing any Yakuza game. Each individual entry gives a unique atmosphere to be immersed in, so even if the game requires you to do the same thing a hundred times over, there are many times where just seeing a brief idle animation and seeing NPCs walk on their merry way will remind you why you're here to begin with. To further explore this unique and beautiful world, to surmount the challenges it may present and, hopefully, have a great story to tell from them in the end. And this video, to me, was just that. So thank you so much for listening to my rambling for this long and for keeping up with the channel. Should the opportunity present itself to where I can do this type of content full time, I'll definitely tackle bigger and more exciting topics as time goes on. Whether or not that day comes, I'll just keep doing what I've done up to now. So again, thank you for being there for the ride. As always, until next time, take care of yourselves and have a great day. Cheers!